Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guest this evening. E.J. Dion is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, and professor in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture at Georgetown University. A respected commentator on politics, he began his career with the New York Times, where he reported on state and local government, national politics, and from around the world, including stints in Paris, Rome, and Beirut. He joined the Washington Post as a reporter covering national politics in 1990 and began writing his column in 1993. His many books include Why Americans Hate Politics, Why the Right Went Wrong, and One Nation After Trump. His new book, Code Red, <laughs> is a well-argued and persuasive treatise by a deeply concerned journalist and citizen. He'll be in conversation tonight with Dick Pullman, professor at the University of Pennsylvania and national political columnist. Please welcome E.J. Dion and Dick Pullman to the Free Library. Oh, thank you for coming, everybody. This is E.J., by the way, in case you're <laughs> messing us up. Um, a lot of people here for a rainy night, so I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, and I want to thank the Free Library for hosting uh, EJ again. We were here actually a year or two ago, as I recall, uh, with Norm Orenstein. Uh, and I love this place. I'll come yeah. anytime you want to <laughs> want to invite me. <laughs> I can't wait. I want to do your book someday. Oh, someday. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I have to be in retirement first. <laughs> Uh, the, um, uh, so anyway, I also want to thank the Free Library for having me back also as a, as a um, conversationalist. Um, hey, there's there any news going on? No, I don't think there was much, <laughs> much news going on. Um, uh, and, uh, you know e the old uh, newspaper slogan, if it happened today, it's news to us. Uh, but <laughs> happens, happens that every, one went out of business. Happens every you know? three minutes is what it is. Uh, EJ's book obviously could, could not be more timely. Uh, it's basically about... Uh, uh, if I can colloquialize it a little bit, uh, how can the, how can the uh, Democrats uh, get their act together and get united? Uh, because obviously the biggest story uh, uh, in our uh, national life is uh, uh, the 2020 election and uh, whether Trump is going to serve one term or more, uh, which I'm sure you would agree that's the biggest story, and this is where your book comes in. Uh, totally. So... so um, <laughs> So, and that's I, and why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote the book. So, <laughs> and we will talk about it uh, uh, at length here, at least about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions, of course. But I, we have to talk a little bit about the news this week, which has been so uh, overwhelming. Of course, they're all, every week it's overwhelming. I, I w I I'm interested, actually, and you could do it in the context of looking at the Democrats in this book. Um, how do you, what do you make of what's happened in Iowa? And I'm not necessarily talking about the glitch with the app. Uh, I'm talking about the breakdown in the vote and how it looks like uh, the first in the nation state is, is, is judging these candidates because nobody really seems to understand who should uh, take the lead in the, um, in the, uh, among the nominees, potential nominees. Yeah, my favorite line on the counting, uh, is this on? I think we, I think I just lost it, is um, can, can you hear me for now? Um, what did I do? Um, you mentioned the Iowa Democratic Party, and my mic goes dead. You know, there's something. <laughs> it's, there's, <laughs> it's all of a piece. Yeah, I think. there's something it's going on. Shadow here. Incorporated is yeah. handling. Oh, the, there we go. Uh, oh, okay. thank you. Is that better? Uh, um, thank you. Um, well, I, in fact, just Andy coming up before I answer the question. My favorite line, by the way, on Iowa and what happened is my friend Joey Reed the other night used the term gizmoization, and that we always go for the most complicated technology even when we don't have to. And I think there's an interesting uh, idea there. So somebody could write a bestseller called gizmoization. <laughs> uh, but I, I really want to first thank Andy Kahan and Laura Kovacs, uh, Kovacs. Um, this venue is one of the greatest venues for authors in the country. Um, and I, I, it really is, and I, I have, I, this is my seventh time here, which I, I, I've interviewed as well. I had a great night, some of you may have been here with David Axelrod also when his book uh, came out. Um, and uh, it's a real service, and I sent out a tweet because I saw a picture of Dr. J uh, back there, and I just said how good a venue 
uh, this is. And to be in the same place that Dr. J was is a special uh, honor. Um, two other, uh, two sets of people I want to acknowledge. One is my dear editor from St. Martin's Press, who is from this area, who really is, if you guys want to write a book, go to Tim Bartlett. He is the best editor. Uh, he is one of the best editors. I also, by the way, want to honor another great editor who passed away this week, uh, Alice Mayu, whom some of you read about. I will forever be grateful to her and to Tim. And I also want to honor Tim Bartlett's mom, who is a book lover and was so kind to uh, be here tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, let's give it up for Tim Bartlett's mom. <laughs> Barbara is her name, Barbara Bartlett. Um, and lastly, I, I have, this sounds like the beginning of a Las Vegas joke, but I really have awesome in-laws. And um, my, uh, my brother-in-law, Brian Boyle, and his son, Rory, fresh from taking care of three kids under three, are somewhere in the room. Bless you for coming out uh, tonight. And um, any of you want to help Rory out, please uh, <laughs> approach him. Now, you're, now to your, uh, your question about Iowa. Um, just looking at it purely as um, a kind of pundit and what happened, how did this happen? Well, really, I think uh, Joe Biden lost in part because Pete Buttigieg won. Um, and one of the striking things is that Joe Biden's issue was the dominant issue for Iowa voters. He wanted, you know, there was a polling question in the entrance poll um, are you voting more to find the strongest candidate against Trump who can be Trump or are you voting on the uh, candidate who's close to you on the issues? Over 60% of the voters said the candidate who can be Trump. But Joe Biden only got a, yeah, go ahead. That's a, I, um, only, Joe Biden only got a quarter of that vote. Pete Buttigieg got another quarter of that vote and the rest of it uh, was scattered. Um, Joe, that Buttigieg positioned himself just a little bit to the left of Biden, which turned out to be a kind of sweet spot for the non-Bernie part of the party. Um, you know, his strongest group were the people who called themselves somewhat liberal. I bet if we did a poll of this room, we'd have 42% of the caucus goers call themselves somewhat liberal. I bet that's a space a lot of people in this room would go to if <laughs> this were a caucus. Um, and so, I, I think that is one big part of the story, and uh, beyond the fact that Buttigieg is a, I think, sort of had a brilliant conception of, of how to turn a, himself a 37-year-old into a candidate, he basically took Joe Biden's strategy. I, I always say, I am so old that I covered Joe Biden when he was the new generation candidate. <laughs> uh, it's true, back in 1987, I looked it up, as you probably wrote these stories too, I wrote a yeah. story about, and he had a great generational appeal. Pete made it work in uh, Iowa. Um, the other part of the story is that Bernie Sanders has a very strong base in the Democratic Party. Um, it's notable that he didn't get the same vote, the size of the vote that he got against Hillary Clinton. I think part of that reflects the fact that some of the Bernie vote in 2016 was an anti-Hillary vote. Um, there was a sort of an ideological vote and an anti-Hillary vote that came together. Um, what worries me about this primary, the first line of my book is, will progressives and moderates feud while the country burns? Um, and if I can pivot entirely artlessly to just uh, offering a sort of a quick synopsis of what the book is about and why I wrote it. Um, I think that at this moment in our history, progressives and moderates, and moderates, we can talk about this, is a complicated term. You could say the left, center left, and uh, let's call them tonight Romney Republicans. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, Some of them uh, probably are yeah, coming there, over. There may be a couple out there tonight. Um, you know, the Thatcher Longstreth Republicans. <laughs> Um, the, um, the, um, the, you know, that this group has more, all these folks from left to center have more in common than they want to realize. Uh, this is the case partly because 
of not only the rise of Donald Trump, whose values they oppose, and I write in the book about what I call the power of negative thinking. We forget that we often define what we're for by first defining what we're against. Ronald Reagan built a whole ideology out of being anti-government, anti-tax, anti-communist. I think Ronald, I, I think Donald Trump has defined so many of the things that this broad coalition uh, of people uh, is against his attacks on decency, his attacks on accepted norms, his mistreatment of uh, immigrants and refugees, his racism, um, his very graceful way of dealing with his opponents. Uh, I, did you watch that thing today that he did? Uh -huh. I, I, against I, my I, will. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, you, it, it was, it's, I, I watched it and I said, that's why I wrote this book. I mean, these things define what we're against and that gives us grounds for agreeing on what we are for because we want to build the alternative uh, up to that. Uh, the, uh, along with that argument are two others. One is that progressives and moderates are actually closer because of the radicalization of the Republican Party, which was really against public action. There used to be even conservative Republicans who believed you needed strong public and government action to solve problems. Bob Dole worked with George McGovern to create the food stamp program after CBS News told the country how many people were going hungry in our nation. Um, you know, and I talk in the book going all the way back to Lincoln with the uh, land grant uh, colleges um, and to Eisenhower with the government student loan program that helped me go to college, um, as well as the interstate highway system. They've given up on public action. And so one of the things I am arguing to both progressives and moderates is please don't spend all your time beating each other's brains in about whether we should be for Medicare for all or a public option. The litmus test is should all Americans get decent, affordable health insurance? Yes. How we get there is important. There are substantive arguments to have. But let's not pretend that the people who might have disagreements over single payer versus public option are as far apart from each other as they are from the people who want to repeal Obamacare altogether. Um, and then the last point I'll make, and then we'll go back to, to good Q&A, is there's a whole conversation about whether this election should be about restoration or transformation. Uh, you know, and Joe Biden is seen as the candidate of restoration, and Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are seen as the candidates of transformation, and Pete's somewhere in the middle. In fact, um, we need both. Uh, we need to restore some of the norms and some of the things we lost because Donald Trump is president. But in order to uproot the problems that helped lead to Trump in the first place, we need to transform our country. I argue that what we're really trying to restore, we are trying to restore progress. And that brings those together, and that ought to bring together this broad coalition that I think must come together in 2020, or our country will be in a lot of long-term trouble. Yeah, you know, uh, well, one quick observation. You said you're, you're old enough to remember Biden when he was in the new generation. I'm old enough to actually have a son the same age as Pete Buttigieg, and that kind of like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't imagine. Well, we him met covering running, the Lincoln campaign back in 1860. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the question is, uh, all right. So you teed this up perfectly, actually. So uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, he's probably coming out of Iowa with the most votes, uh, albeit not the most fantastic turnout, but the most votes. Uh, it looks like he could win New Hampshire. Uh, Nevada is a caucus state, and he's well organized for a caucus. He could win Nevada. That could all. You know, that could impact what happens in South Carolina, which is supposedly Biden's stonewall, uh, stonewall his uh, firewall. Uh, so <laughs> that's not a Freudian slip. So the question is... Um, could be a Bernie and slip, is Bernie, actually. Can Bernie be a... Can Bernie... This is my concern, actually, myself, looking at this. Is, can Bernie be a unifier for both, for both uh, uh, camps in the Democratic Party? Because I'm not sure he can. And I was concerned because I saw a poll last week that said that when all the different supporters of the different candidates were asked, could you support another candidate if your, if your own candidate can't win? And they were all up around 90% or more saying yes. Uh, the people who support Bernie, only 53% said they could. So that to me is a concern, uh, and it's something that Trump, uh, you know, who's uh, very, very clever, 
uh, about uh, sowing divisions on the other, in the other camp. That, that, that's something that, that's a little, one of those divisions he can exploit again as he tries to champion Bernie is to, is to uh, work on that divi divisiveness. Are you concerned about Bernie being able to uh, unify the party if, in fact, he gets momentum? Well, that is one of my concerns in the book. If uh, for Bernieites in the audience, I, I give Bernie a lot of credit for things in my book. I think the most important contribution that Bernie Sanders has made to our politics is he has reminded us of where the actual political spectrum is. What actually is democratic socialism? Where is the left? Uh, and the, one of the frustrations of the Bernie supporters, that movement that I share, is that our political conversation was dominated for 30, 35 years by assumptions set by the Reagan era. Uh, that, that the Reagan era assumptions, I think, really narrowed our sense of possibility, narrowed our sense of where the political spectrum lay. And so you had the craziness of talking about Obamacare based on ideas from such you know, left-wing groups as the Heritage Foundation and such left-wing people as Mitt Romney, God bless him again. Um, we should talk about Romney. That was a really remarkable speech he gave. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, this was no left-wing idea. This wasn't socialism. Single payer is socialism. So I honor Bernie for actually broadening uh, our sense of the conversation. I actually had, for those of you who are interested in Bernie or Bernie fans, I had a great conversation with him uh, four and a half years, almost yeah, four years ago, um, maybe five years ago at the Brookings Institution, uh, which is funny to see Bur you know, Brookings is not yeah. seen as, where I work is correctly not seen as a haven for democratic socialists. And, um, you know, we had, a, we had a really interesting conversation. So I think that is a very positive thing for our country. Similarly, I think a number of the Elizabeth Warren ideas, particularly the wealth tax, where I think at this moment in history, when wealth is so concentrated, we do need to start talking about how to tax wealth. It might not be her way. It might be higher capital gains taxes. It might be higher estate uh, taxes for the uh, very wealthy. But it's really good that she has put that on the agenda. Um, the question is, uh, can you get all of it at once? Uh, and I think what our history says is that fundamental change happens step by step. As you know, uh, Dick, having read the book, one of, one of my heroes who actually is a democratic socialist is Michael Harrington, you know, who wrote The Other America many years ago. Oh, I love having Harrington. Yeah, you had Harrington. a good quote from him in the book. Yeah, there, and, and Harrington, Harrington always described himself as being on the left wing of the possible. Um, but he also had a term which I use uh, as a fundamental idea, which is visionary gradualism. Uh, and I argue that visionary gradualism really describes where people who are more moderate and where people who are more progressive have to come down. Progressives are right that if an idea isn't visionary, if it isn't really trying to solve a serious problem, social security is a good example, um, if it's just some small piddling little thing, it's not gonna gather much support and it's not gonna solve a problem. Progressives are right to insist on that. But uh, more moderate people or pragmatic people, if you wanna call them that, um, are right to say maybe we can't do this all at once. If you go back and look at the social security system as it was created under Franklin Roosevelt, it was wholly inadequate. It excluded large numbers of African Americans uh, because of the jobs that were excluded because Roosevelt had to get it through a Congress with a lot of segregationist Southern Democrats in it. But over a period of years, Social Security was reformed, so we did eventually uh, include everybody. I think we can see that kind of, civil rights was the same. There were two civil rights bills that didn't do all that much were passed in the 1950s. They were steps forward, they weren't big steps, but they helped lead to the big steps of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and voting rights. So that's where I would like to plead with my friends on the left uh, to say, um, if somebody doesn't fully agree with you on single payer but really wants to cover everybody, if somebody says, well, maybe we can't do free college all at once, by the way, that's not so radical. You, people old enough in this room to remember when public colleges were very close to free, so it's not as radical as it sounds. But you know, uh, if we get there through steps, if we uh, figure out how to combine free college with 
uh, post uh, high school training for people who need it, who don't want to go to college but want to earn a decent income. Um, you know, let's get together on that. The Green New Deal I talk about a lot in the book. The Green New Deal has been vilified in ways that I think are unfair. Um, fundamentally, what the Green New Deal is about is saying that when we have to fix climate change quickly, because uh, this is a real threat, but we have to have other things alongside it uh, to um, assist people in the economy, to help the economy move forward, because there's going to be disruption in this process. Um, I think we ought to come together. And so it does worry me when I see sectarianism uh, on you know, parts of the left. Uh, but I also worry about sectarianism in the center that kind of wants to write off the left. And so the last point I'll make on, on this question is, the 2018 elections were a real model uh, for how you build a majority. Um, it's amazing what happened in 2018. If you looked at the Democratic vote in midterms in 2014 versus 2018, 25 million more votes were cast for Democratic House candidates in 2018 than 2014. How did you do that? Well, there were a lot of progressives elected. AOC was elected. Ayanna Presley was elected in Boston. But a whole lot of moderates helped create the House majority uh, that allow AOC and Ayanna Presley and others uh, to have more influence than they would have if Democrats didn't hold those suburban seats, didn't hold those formerly Republican uh, seats. And in the book, I, I traveled a lot in 2018, and I spent time with Abigail Spanberger, um, you know, a moderate former CIA agent. She's a, she was a really lovely woman up in, in Virginia who took a Tea Party seat. And I spent a lot of time with, I, I spent some time with Ayanna Presley, who's also a really impressive woman. And I wrote a column right after the election saying, Ayanna Presley and Abigail Spanberger have to become best friends. Uh, and that is really a, a metaphor. Uh, somebody wrote a great New York Times magazine piece afterward about the two of them. Um, but that is really a metaphor to what I'm arguing in this piece, because neither of them can get where they want to go without the other. Well, you know, let's go back to health care for a second, because that was one of the main drivers of the uh, new House majority in 2018, was right. basically, uh, I think the, the word went out, I, this is Pelosi, I think, that uh, let's, um, let's focus on, uh, on uh, fixing Obamacare, making Obamacare better incrementally, a la Social Security in a way, and focusing on the fact that the uh, uh, Trump and the Republicans are trying to take Obamacare away uh, through uh, a federal, right now there's a, a lawsuit in federal court to take it away. So, Which you know, they are conveniently like we, putting yeah. off till after the well, election. And that seemed, you know, so when he says during the State of the Union, uh, you know, I'll always protect your pre -exist your uh, coverage for pre-existing conditions. It's like he's trying to kill it in this federal lawsuit. So what, 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 what concerns me a little bit is that uh, uh, pushing too hard on Medicare for all uh, is, uh, and, and the fact that there is a quote-unquote socialist aspect to it, I'm not saying that is a pejorative, plays into Trump's hands where if you were talking just on the incremental, let's fix Obamacare and make it better, you could also focus more on they're trying to take away Obamacare as we have it. And so, you know, I concern that overreaching, the, the danger of overreaching, and, and screwing up the health care issue, which right now is a winning issue for Democrats, if they can agree that it is. No, I am very worried about that, too. I mean, health care was the number one issue other than Trump uh, t uh, in, the, uh, 20, in the 2018 elections. Yeah. And with Democrats have an overwhelming advantage on the health care issue because most of the country does not want to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act. In fact, they would like to expand it. Uh, and to throw away that issue would be a big mistake. And that's why I think we need to have this argument in stages, that the likelihood of passing um, Medicare for all in the next Congress is very small. Um, if the Republicans hold the Senate, it may be very hard to pass anything, which is something we have to uh, think about. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell has a big waste paper basket where he puts bills that were passed uh, by the House. Um, and so, yes, I think, you know, and so I think people who believe in a single-payer system can make this case. They can, and, you know, the strongest part of their argument is single-payer would probably contain costs more 
uh, than any sort of sort of addition to Obamacare. And I've I've heard some very serious non-radical healthcare people make the case that there were certain benefits to the idea of single payer. I just don't see how we transition that quickly. Um, and also, the healthcare plays an enormous role uh, in our economy. And so I think we have to look carefully at uh, you know how we change this system going forward. And again, visionary gradualism. This is not about selling out the idea of covering everybody. I mean, that's urgent. And paradoxically, if you put all your eggs in the single payer basket, you might set back the cause of expanding coverage to everybody. So let's get everybody covered, and then let's have our debate about the next step, where I think the advocates of single payer can make their case. Did you see? I I I couldn't help note what happened to Elizabeth Warren, and I found this a little. This she must be frustrated about this. And this is she tried something that was definitely in the realm of visionary, of visionary gradualism. At first, she signed on. Uh, in one of the early debates last summer, she's basically signed on to uh, Medicare for All, you know, Bernie's bill. I wrote the damn bill, you know, that the stuff that he got. That was say. pretty good. Yeah, you know, yeah not as good as Colbert. Uh, but, do okay. some more, do some I, more I watch a lot here. of Colbert, so I see it on there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, all right, so she signed on to that, uh, and then she was taking some heat from that. And then, I'm sure you know, as you mentioned in the book, you know, she did a, I think you called this your term, a mid course correction, and she. She split it up and she said, all right, like the, if I was president, the first bill would be, you know, to let's, you know, let's improve Obamacare, et cetera. And then later on, uh, second half of her first term or whatever, right. we'd have a bill to go more towards single payer. So, uh, but then some people thought it was a flip flop. And that was kind of where her, her poll, her poll well, approval was... stalled. And uh, so that's kind of because she was trying to bridge the progressive pragmatist divide. And I, it seemed to me that she suffered for it. And, Am no, I, I, that, I think or? that's totally right. It, it, that I have again, I have a lot of respect for her. I don't, I don't have a candidate yet, by the way. I am, which Nor is actually I. very I convenient for me peddling a book like this because I'm saying everybody has to come together. But that's an honest and true statement because I can kind of make a case for everybody in this field, um, and I have a lot of respect for Warren um, for you know in so many areas, uh, particularly. Um, the first time I ever wrote about her was when she opposed that horrible bankruptcy bill uh, that they passed, and she was 100% right uh, about that bill. It really did not protect people enough from medical bankruptcy and all kinds of other problems. Um, but um, the, the, this was a case where I think she actually made a political decision because she was worried. She was really building a coalition, and she was vulnerable perhaps to her left, to Bernie, uh, and I think that she sort of said that she was, for, her earlier position was actually a more nuanced position. Then she embraced Medicare for All. Then she came under a lot of pressure, right. both to say how she would pay for it. And in, in the process of doing that, she had to put out a proposal that suggested cuts in healthcare costs that were very hard uh, to believe. And I think this hurt her because healthcare had never been her central issue. She was the policy maven in this campaign. She was, I, you know, I have a plan for that. And she really did put out a lot of plans, including like a very practical, doable, universal childcare plan. And so I think this kind of hit that brand uh, very hard. And it's, you know, and I think that uh, really, uh, you know, caused this kind of tumble. Um, it's going to be interesting this week to see, you know, can she come back uh, in New Hampshire? Uh, in the end, the paradox of the whole deal is she seems to have ceded some support to Bernie, which was exactly the opposite of what she hoped uh, would come out of this. Do you think there's any misogyny going on in the fact that she was demand to, people were demanding so much that she say how it was going to cost, how much it was going to cost M Medicare for all, and then she did that in detail. And every time Bernie's asked, he basically says, "I don't know the number. I don't have the number." You know, don't basically don't ask me for a number, and uh, seems to get away with it. Are you asking me whether women are treated differently than men in American <laughs> political campaigns? The, um, Is it funny how I, that worked there? No, I, I don't know. I, I think you know. I don't know if that was misogyny, but there is clearly misogyny in politics. There's a great story that is. Uh, and maybe you couldn't get away with this now, although I'm not sure. There was a woman running in a Democratic primary uh, for governor of Mississippi, and she was winning, and she was very popular. And the, her opponent 
uh, was trying to figure out how to bring her down. And they, and then remember, this is a Democratic primary. Um, and they decided how they would go at her. And they had a picture of a member of the National Guard at a firing range where the message was the governor of Mississippi is the commander in chief of the Mississippi National Guard. And it never said anything about her, but her numbers started uh, collapsing. And it was sort of an extreme case of the difficulty of being a woman running for office. Now, I think we're a little better than that now. Uh, I don't think you could put quite get away with that ad. Uh, but yeah, I don't think there's any question that misogyny was part of the reason Hillary Clinton lost. There were a lot of other reasons uh, that that, well, actually, let's correct myself, why she lost the Electoral College. Um, the, um, uh, you know, so I think that did play a role, even though there were other things going on there. All right, well, let me, all right, so we're talking about some of her problems. We're talking about some of, uh, you know, potential problems that Bernie could have. Uh, we talked about whether uh, Buttigieg is a little too young or not. We've certainly been talking about Biden's stumble in Iowa, and we don't know what's going to happen coming forward. The, what I'm getting at is um, th bridging the divide in a party often depends on having a leader step forward to basically bring it all together. You have to have a per, you know, people don't necessarily vote on the abstract, they vote through a person. And what I think Obama was so good at, for example, was he was able to, you know, bridge that divide. A lot of people were able to see in him what they, in some ways, wanted to see, but he was able to bridge left and center in the party to a, to a fairly good extent. Uh, and I'm not saying that, uh, is there another Obama in this group, but there isn't. But is it, is it, is it, <laughs> well, we're, I was gonna ask about him too, but is it, is it fair to say that until they have an actual, a coalesce around a nominee who can, can bridge these two camps, that we're not gonna know for quite a while uh, whether this is gonna work. I mean, it has to be through a person, a leader. Well, there are two things. One, I wrote this book because I want everybody in this race and lots of people who are activists to be thinking about the imperative of coming together. Uh, primaries are often difficult. People say all sorts of things about each other. After all, you know, if we're running against each other, you think you're way better than I am for this particular job, and that leads to contention. Uh, that's A. B, there are some real philosophical differences between, say, Biden, Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar on the one side, Warren here, and then Bernie uh, somewhere over here. Those are real differences that we um, argue out. Um, the problem is if, as I said, if we sort of go into these fights thinking, well, the primary is everything, this argument is everything, as against the argument that all of us together need to have with a radicalized right and Donald Trump, then we are in big trouble. Um, and I think you're right. I think at the moment there's a hunger for somebody who could look like that person who could pull them together. And I think it's going to be an interesting challenge going forward. Elizabeth Warren made a run at that um, at the end of the Iowa caucuses where mm -hmm. she was arguing that precisely because she, uh, she didn't put it this way, but essentially because she occupies a position between where Bernie is and where Biden is, she might be the person who could pull, uh, pull the party and this broader movement together. Um, you know, Bloomberg will make that claim, I, su yeah. I How does he suspect. Fit? Thank you for whoever yelled that out. How does he fit into all this? Um, I, now, there's a lot of people on the, le on the left of the party who are, you know, dead set against him. Uh, stop and frisk and stuff he did in New York, et cetera. His wealth. Uh, uh, but he's driving Trump crazy, and that would be a good thing, don't you think? I'm, right. Um, the, I, I, so, to, so two thoughts on Bloomberg. Um, one is that um, when the history of this campaign is written, I think if Bloomberg is true to what he's promised, and I have no reason to believe he won't be, he promises to keep spending his money all the way to the end. Um, and while f those of us who believe in campaign finance reform and political reform, which I very much do, uh, look at that and say this is what's wrong with the system. It is also the case that we are running the election in this system where Donald Trump 
uh, is really going to have unlimited sums uh, as to what it's looking like available mm -hmm. to him. And if Bloomberg spends this money all the way to the end, that is going to make a material difference uh, in the election. Uh, and that's just true. Um, and I think in the end, um, even Democrats will say, I don't believe in this, will at some point might be grateful to have that spending in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, and Arizona at certain points. Um, Bloomberg himself, um, there is, but having said all that, there is something bothersome about somebody coming into the race and blowing everybody out with money. I mean, he had spent $315 million and recently said, I'm doubling that. Um, I, I, there was either the Washington Post, my paper, or the New York Times, I think it was the Post, had this little site about, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, I forgot what he paid for um, the Bloomberg, for the Super Bowl mm -hmm. ad, but it was some, somebody remember? 10 million. Yeah, 10 million. 10 million. Uh, they had Pocket this, change, right? yeah, where you could take your income and put it in and see where, um, what you could buy with the equivalent amount out of your income. And my assistant at work said she got a taco at Taco Bell out of, uh, you know. And so there is something bothersome about that. And then finally, there will be philosophical debates. He is clearly more on the side of the party that Biden and Buttigieg are on. But, um, you know, he was actually a decent mayor of New York City. I think that's true. I think that there were some progressive criticisms against him that were legit. Uh, uh, you know, stop and frisk is part of that. There were other things he did that were very egalitarian in terms of a thought, you know, of kind of a workable progressive social policy. Yeah, so, nobody's perfect. I'm not, no politician does, you know, you can't hit 100% on anybody. And this, right. is, I think, is what everybody in the party has to has to understand. I was just going to m mention that he said he is, uh, that he would spend a uh, billion dollars um, um, this year, whether it's for him or for other Democrats, one billion, which basically means that he would go broke in 60 years. <laughs> so, yeah, Except maybe he'll make more than a billion <laughs> on the rest of the income, so he might not have to, he might not have he to also, worry. And, and Trump doesn't like the fact that he's short. Um, but then I looked up, uh, James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, was three inches shorter than Bloomberg, so it doesn't right. seem like much of an issue. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I did that looking up, and I said this yeah. height matter, and well, I, it, it's, a, it's an unsettled question, because James Madison was our shortest president, and Abraham Lincoln was our tallest president. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody in between, which would include Trump, has more problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, um, let's take some questions. Um, so my question is about Buttigieg. Do, do the Democrats think that a candidate like him, a young, inexperienced gay man, will have success in the Midwest and the South? You know, it's, I raised this question um, with a, I, actually I didn't even raise the question, he raised it. I was talking to a Republican political consultant who really can't stand Trump and actually, although I don't think he'd ever say this publicly, wants a candidate he can vote for uh, against Trump, wants to vote for a Democrat. And he would have a problem with Bernie, uh, might have a problem with Warren, he'd have no problems uh, with Pete. And he was making the case that the folks you would lose uh, because of um, his uh, sexual identity, because he's a married gay man, are mo almost entirely people you probably, the Democrats would probably already lose. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that's true, but he was making a rather strong case, uh, and he was not trying to sink the Democrats. He, he was arguing that at this moment, as opposed to even five or 10 years ago, uh, that's the case. The fascinating thing about Buttigieg is he combines being, um, as, as he likes to say, who knew that a a uh, married gay military veteran who is Maltese would get this far uh, in uh, a race. Um, Buttigieg is very traditional in so many ways and in so many of the ways that he talks about himself, including his marriage, the fact that he is religious, he's church going. Um, he is, by the way, a liturgical conservative, he says. You wonder if that sort of offsets uh, some of it. Um, I don't know the answer to that question yet. I don't think we uh, you know, in a sense, we can't settle it. I mean, people wondered whether Barack Obama could be uh, elected president of the United States. Now, granted, he had a big, big 
uh, economic collapse going for him in 2008. That clearly helped him win. Um, but he got the highest vote that any Democrat has gotten since Lyndon Johnson uh, in 2008. So I don't know the answer to, uh, answer to that question. And, um, you know, which ism is more uh, pernicious, uh, is more, has more political effect? Is it uh, heterosexism? Is it racism? Is it sexism? I don't know the answer uh, to that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, th this sounds like a hedge because it is. I, I've, I've struggled with this question. And I'm inclined, you know, I, I've watched him actually for some years, Buttigieg. He's an incredibly talented uh, politician, as you can see from what he did um, in Iowa. And I think there are other things in his character and personality mm -hmm. that may offset some of the prejudice. But I don't know the answer to that question. But it's a question a lot of Democrats are asking themselves, for sure. Do you agree that the uh, Americans always have this dream that uh, any fresh new face can fix everything, that experience doesn't count? To me, Pete is just too young and too inexperienced. I don't care about his uh, uh, <coughs> sexual orientation. No, I think that is, uh, that's a question he's, uh, he's going to have to answer. I mean, we, there, we like youth, but we don't necessarily like inexperience. Uh, you know, if you, if you go back uh, to, uh, you know, John Kennedy was young, Bill Clinton was young, Barack Obama was relatively young. Um, I think Democrats especially like younger candidates. If you go back over the last half century, um, with uh, a couple of exceptions, maybe Harry Truman, um, uh, the Democrats nominated people in their 50s or 40s when, uh, when they got elected. So, but youth doesn't have to equal inexperience. Um, and in Buttigieg's case, but in his case, he's going to have to he's going to have to answer uh, answer that question. I think what I think what Iowans saw in him was a fresh argument and somebody uh, removed from both the old arguments in the party and uh, from Washington. And because you can speak in small venues, he's very impressive to people one on one. Um, and you know, I think he just won uh, won a lot of people a lot of people over. Um, but yeah, experience. You know, I guess my view is experience matters. It's not the most important thing. I've thought about this over the years. There are many elections I think where I voted for a less experienced candidate over a more experienced candidate because I preferred the values and of the. Uh, less experienced candidate in the direction they, uh, you know, the candidate wanted to move the country. But again, I think each of you uh, identified exactly the kind of questions that he's going to face uh, in the next week. And after New Hampshire and South Carolina and Nevada, it's going to be a really right. hard race because yeah. you're going to move to all of these states. It will be, um, you know, if any candidate. Uh, who survives that will have to have a certain amount of strength, whether they can win or not. We'll it's see. A lot of tarmac, uh, uh, campaign. tarmac campaigning, yeah. and TV and TV ads and social media ads. We've uh, moved a lot on uh, in terms of how we uh, gay people in politics because, as recently as 2004, uh, the Bush re-election campaign staged all these uh, state referendums on gay marriage, uh, and the whole uh, point was to uh, gin up conservative turnout in some of those swing states like Ohio, I think was one of them. And you know, that's, you know, 15, 16 years later, it's completely off the table. There is no um, issue on which public opinion in America uh, has moved quicker than on LGBTQ uh, yeah. issues. And I, th yeah, go, yeah. Okay. And we sh And marijuana, uh, probably. And, <laughs> um, um, and I think the most revolutionary thing that happened is gay people started coming out uh, after in the 60s and 70s and suddenly, and there's a lot of polling evidence for this, and then when you discovered that somebody you really loved or cared about or worked with or admired that this person was gay, it changed people's, became much harder to hold on to the view they had. And on gay marriage, um, I came to it later than some, so I don't pretend, I came to it before Obama did. Uh, but, um, <laughs> like you know, I, I've actually written about this whole, my whole uh, struggle. I, I thought, 
I, I had an argument with Andrew Sullivan, if you know Andrew, who's very smart, where he was against gay civil rights laws and wanted to put gay marriage first. I thought gay civil rights laws should come first. Anyway, uh, I came around to it in like 2007, 2008. And, you know, what I thought is you heard all of these conservatives say, you know, gay marriage, uh, gay and lesbian marriage is going to wreck the family. And all I could say is, you know, we heterosexual people have done a heck of a job <laughs> of wrecking marriage all by <laughs> ourselves, and we didn't need anybody to help us. Does it really matter that there's so much division right now? Because the Republican field was completely divided in 2016, and certainly no one was... Where are you? I, I can't see you, ma'am. Oh, here. thank you. Yeah, I wanted to see you. Go ahead. <laughs> You mean so that you mean the Republicans got over it in 2016? Why can't Democrats? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good question. I've thought about that, and not only that, but they nominated the most extreme candidate they could possibly have nominated. Although we could make arguments about him and Cruz if we, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, if we wanted to. Um, the um, no, there's truth in that, and and, and look, the there were moments when the the um, Obama Hillary fight in 2008 got bitter, although it wasn't really a sharp ideological uh, split in 2008 in the same way, um, in the same way uh, this is. Um, the problem is the Republicans are, uh, and if I can plug somebody else's book, uh, Ezra Klein's great book, Why, we are, Why Are We Polarized? Um, you know, the Republican Party is much more compact and less diverse uh, than the Democratic Party in every way. Um, and so holding that coalition together uh, is a lot easier than holding the Democratic coalition together because, you know, the Democratic Party is African Americans and Latinos and white people and Asians. It, it's sort of everybody is in the Democratic Party. Philosophically, the Republican Party is two-thirds or more conservative. Uh, Democrats are about half liberal. They're more liberal than they used to be, but still only about half of Democrats call themselves liberal, the rest call themselves moderate or conservative, so they cover much more philosophical uh, ground. Um, and so it, it's harder to bring, just because of the nature of the beast, uh, it's harder to bring the Democratic Party uh, together uh, because of that diversity. And yet that diversity is, over the long run, uh, what gives the progressive side of politics its strength, because the other characteristic of the conservative coalition is it's much older uh, than the progressive coalition. And so I always tell my kids, my, the book is dedicated to the next generation. And I always tell my kids that I'm actually not worried about this country because when their generation takes over and my generation is gone, we're gonna be a much better country. And the only problem with that is I wanna be around to see it. <laughs> so I've supported Bernie monetarily ever since he got in the Senate and I've been a democratic socialist since Michael Harrington. And oh, so I, you get you were one of the clappers yeah, for Michael. Yeah. Oh, excellent. And yeah. um, you know, if Bernie somehow got in the White House, I would be delighted. But I'm just worried that he can't. And so I tried to do calculations. Who who could I support? And you know, who's got some of the best positives and some of the least negatives, and could maybe do the bridging that you're talking about. You know, and someone who strikes me is Amy Klobuchar, and I don't hear much about her. Her name came up once from you. Wow. So, so what do you think about her? Thank you. you well, clearly, you're, the answer, the audience answered your uh, question. I, I, well, could you forgive me one of my favorite stories about Michael Harrington? Michael Harrington was somebody I, I really loved. The reason I want to say this is because I thought he had the definitive uh, comment about God. Uh, some of you may know I'm very interested in religion. I teach it, I write about it, um, and I'm a Catholic. And Mike was a Catholic who lost his faith, became a Marxist, and right, he, he knew he was dying. He had cancer, yeah. and uh, he was talking to his aunt. And I'm from New England. His aunt, uh, who is a nun, and um, he said, look, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God, so I don't believe in heaven. But if there is a God, I think he will let me into heaven and if he lets me into heaven, I am going to look at God and say, why must you mumble? Uh, and, and I want to tell him that too. Anyway, um, the, no, what's fascinating is I think if anyone got hurt last week uh, in Iowa by the Senate trial, it was Klobuchar. 
uh, because I think if you look at late deciders, uh, she did quite well with them. Her numbers were going up. Um, and I think there was a real competition between Klobuchar and Buttigieg uh, for the, you know, in that wing of the party uh, uh, for the, you know, the non-Biden vote. Um, and I think that that really cost her a lot uh, because it, to really create a sense of momentum in Iowa, you really need to be on the ground. Uh, so I think that's um, that's part of the that's part of the problem she had, and I don't I don't see a way she can get back in it because she doesn't seem to be performing um, you know all that well in New Hampshire. She's not doing terribly, um, but you you really have um, you know a a certain uh, set a, a certain constituency being cut in at least three ways by Biden, Klobuchar, and Buttigieg. Uh, and, um, you know, at some point, somebody will probably have to give way. And if Klobuchar is the one who's at the bottom, um, I think it's, it's, she may not get to Pennsylvania for you to vote for her uh, in the primary. Uh, but yeah, and I, I, one of the things I like that she talks about are the 137 things she'll do immediately as president <laughs> that she, uh, um, you know, that she can do as president. And, um, yeah, so I, I think she's a really interesting candidate, but I think she just missed her opportunity. She needed to rise earlier, I think, to catch a wave in Iowa. She could end up on the tick on the lower half of the ticket, depending she could. on what happens. Yes. That wouldn't surprise me. In light of the importance of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is there a realistic chance that our great Senator Bob Casey could be the vice presidential nominee? Oh, that's an interesting idea. First of all, I love you for saying the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania <laughs> as somebody who grew up in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So did I. Uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth is a really interesting idea, but we won't go there tonight. It's a, uh, but it's a good concept. Uh, I don't see, hear him. He's somebody I really like personally, and I've sort of dealt with some, a, a fair amount over the years. Um, I don't think he is uh, on the lists uh, at the moment. Uh, but you're right, Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania really matters. I, I think the way, what the polling suggests is that if you see the first three critical states as Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin, the hardest get of the three is Wisconsin. Uh, although I'm not sure there is somebody on the ticket that will carry you, as somebody to put on the ticket uh, that will carry you uh, Wisconsin. Um, here's, here's, uh, something to conjure. Uh, imagine that Donald Trump loses the popular vote by five, six million, which is very possible. I think you could see margins against him grow in New York, grow in California, grow in uh, a lot of other That's states, the Massachusetts, That's the problem. Uh, Maryland. Metro states, um, coastal. If he if he loses, if he carries, if he loses Pennsylvania, the Democrats, if he loses Michigan, but carries Wisconsin and manages to hold on to that one elector for Maine. In other words, if he holds on everything else, he wins by two electoral votes. Uh, if he loses that elector for Maine, this scenario means the election would end in a tie. Uh, now imagine that. Boy, uh, so he'd, people he'd be better get a lot to work. about that one, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's regarding uh, Mitt Romney's vote. Do you believe, so he voted to convict on abuse of power, but not on obstruction of justice. Do you believe his vote was truly about his personal his personal offense to the ethics of the president, or was it a political vote? Be uh, you know, I I I honestly think that if you look at the politics for him and uh, the grief this is going to create for him in public life, it was a principled vote, uh, and I really admired it. I. Um, and I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I was actually curious, I'd like to see why he split the difference, but I think, you know, if, what his sort of rationale uh, was, but he, you know, the speech he gave was so heartfelt and so critical of Trump on, on the fundamental question of did Trump abuse his power uh, was this wrong? Was this indefensible? He was uh, unrelenting and uncompromising. 
Um, and I particularly liked uh, the fact that he talked about his religious faith uh, because when you contrast what Mitt Romney said with what President Trump talked about at the prayer breakfast, um, uh, you know, it was a real challenge to two kinds of people. It was a real challenge to the religious right, uh, basically saying, how can you be a Christian, in, in the case of Romney and they, um, and support this man. But it was also a real challenge to others who might say religion has no role in politics at all because religion uh, at its best is a call to conscience, uh, you know, as Martin Luther King and so many others uh, have taught us. Um, and so I have to say, I, I just can't be cynical about Romney's vote. I thought it was so powerful and sent such a strong message and it changed the nature of the discussion. And you can tell it really did, because Donald Trump was really mad. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it doesn't it always, and don't you think, my other theory was that it potentially gives permission for uh, some non-Democrats, maybe some people uh, of faith, uh, to look harder at Trump and break with him you know, that maybe he was sending a message to certain, I don't know, soft Republicans uh, that uh, it's okay uh, to vote against him uh, this year for the reasons that he laid out. I mean, you know, that's, that's, why that's my I, optimistic theory. No, but, but I've started think? talking about Romney Republicans for that reason, right. because yeah. what's interesting about him is he's pretty conservative. He pointed out, you know, that he voted 80% of the time uh, for with Trump, it's not like he's some he's right. not Jacob Javits or Clifford Case or many of the old liberal Republicans that somebody old as old as I am remember fondly, um, you know. And so, yeah, I I think that he does open the way for some. And what's going to be interesting, I think he really put the other mo uh, relatively moderate, I mean, moderate Republican is largely a misnomer now, unfortunately, um, but it's like jumbo shrimp. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, but the, I, I think he really made life more difficult for Susan Collins to defend her vote, more difficult for Cory Gardner yeah. uh, to defend his vote, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. All right, well, that tees up. Uh, I have one last question. I'm sorry to say that, as they say on cable, we're almost out of time. Um, but so, I will be <laughs> signing books, yes, and I will be that. happy to talk that's to you. That, uh, that's, that's the paid <laughs> commercial afterwards. Yeah, the, um, uh, so I used to say, I need to send my kids to college. You know, <laughs> please come and buy a book, but I've only got one left in college, so I don't have that. She's almost done. Anyway. So give it everything. <laughs> so, so on the optimism scale, one being least optimistic, ten being the most, what do you think the prospects are for throwing Trump out this year, um, given everything we've been saying? Now, you have to understand this comes from someone who a friend once called a felicopath, uh, which is like a glass one-tenth full person, you know? Uh, <laughs> but um, I, think, um, I think the a substantial majority of Americans wants Trump to go and that his opponents, the Democrats in this case, plus the Romney Republicans and independents, uh, have to make it as easy as possible for them to do so. My biggest worry is that we will spend our time beating each other up, creating litmus tests. We gotta invite people in. We need to build a majority. You don't build a majority if you don't invite people in. My friend Mark Shields likes to say that in politics, as in religion, you can hunt for heretics, or you can seek out converts. If there was any time in our history when we needed to be convert seekers, this is it. And so if my book does anything else, I hope you may all become convert seekers. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Thank you.